We'd like to introduce Debbie Chagai, who is the Executive Director of Americans for Safe Access. Debbie, welcome to Candle World Expo. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, everyone. Excited to be here. Um, let me share my screen. I'm going to, uh, today I'm going to talk to you about um, kind of a national view of patient access. Um, can you guys see this okay? Oops, I didn't mean to do that. No, oh, whatever. Um, can you guys see the screen okay? Um, so today I'm going to talk to you about um, patient access across the U.S., but not just, I'm not just going to focus on the access, but I'm also going to talk about the lack of access that still exists in so many parts across the country, including states with medical and adult use um, programs. I am also gonna talk about how we can continue to grow from a patient perspective um, and um, uh, how to um, you know, keep advocacy going to, to get federal legalization and get everything we need out of, um, out of the United States. So let me just tell you a little bit about Americans for Safe Access if you've never heard of them. You should. Um, ASA has been around since 2002. We are the oldest national organization of patient caregivers, um, uh, medical professionals, scientists, um, concerned citizens, all with the same mission of um, safe and legal access to cannabis for therapeutic use and research. Um, we are an organization for and about patients. Patients are our priority. Um, here's a few just pictures I just wanted to throw in there of um, things that we've done. We, we go up to Capitol Hill, we have lobby days, uh, we talk to legislators, we have events, we rally together. Um, back when there were a bunch of raids, we would always uh, have raid alerts and get people together. Uh, we have chapters all over the country. So if you want to join a chapter, um, you're welcome. They're all listed on our website. Um, and we're, we just all work together to do a lot of um, amazing things. Um, and part of what we do is also try to end the stigma and uh, try to educate people because depending on where you live, that stigma is still very, very, very much alive um, and sadly. And, and so I'm gonna kind of talk about a little bit of like of that um, in some of my slides. So here is the, um, the state of states as it looks right now. I just updated this graph um, just a few days ago because we had um, a few states hop on to adult use, which I'm gonna talk about in a moment. But right now I just wanna say 48 states and territories have some form of access. Um, 16 adult use states uh, and DC and Guam. The recent additions include Arizona, Montana, New Jersey, New York, South Dakota, and Virginia. 36 states with full medical cannabis programs, um, 12 low THC states or CBD only states, um, and two, only two states right now in one territory have nothing. Um, but when you look at this map, this map only so shows one thing. It shows uh, which states have programs, which states have a law. It doesn't really talk about access. It just talks about where there are laws. But as you guys know, laws and regulations differ in every single state and jurisdiction. Um, but uh, the, let me just, if I haven't said already, purple is medical and adult use states. The dark blue is medical only. The light blue, all these are CBD states. And no MJ laws are those just Idaho and Nebraska right now. Oh, and uh, American Samoa. Um, so the, the map kind of paints this beautiful picture of, of access, if you really look at it. If you just look at it and take those two states where there's no access, you're like, wow, this is amazing. But that's not the reality of what we're seeing, especially from a patient perspective. Um, so before I talk about, keep going on about national, I just want to say that in case you hadn't heard, on December 2nd of 2020, the United Nations Commission on Narcotic Drugs voted to adopt the World Health recommendation to update drug treaties to recognize cannabis as medicine. This is amazing news. I mean, we're actually gonna celebrate, we're gonna have a big celebration on December 2nd, 2021. So keep 
an eye out for more information about that. We're going to make it World Medical Cannabis Day. Um, and we're working with uh, patient organizations across the country to do this. So, but what I want to show here is this map right here, 44 countries with access to medical cannabis at the federal level. And those are the purple countries. Um, look at that yellow, United States is not one of those countries. So the United States is falling behind 44 countries that actually legalize cannabis at the federal level. So we're already behind, we're already behind. Um, so just recently I mentioned the, I updated the map because New York, Virginia and New Mexico all just added adult use programs, which is great because we know that adult use helps patients gain access. But also on the flip side, the problem is lots of times when uh, adult use programs come in, they tend to push the medical aside. They don't make any changes to the medical program. Um, and they, they only focus on the legalization aspect or the adult use aspect. Um, and if you know, patients have very specific needs and you know, sometimes they need a lot of medicine, they need it every day and they need it for the rest of their lives. And sometimes they need very specific medicine. So patient priorities are really important. Even with legalization, even when legalization comes in or adult use programs come in, we still need to make patients the priority. Um, I was gonna kind of go over the laws in New York, Virginia, uh, just really, really quickly, but I'm not sure that's really necessary. But if you wanna know what these laws are, um, they. All of this is on our website. We're gonna be updating it soon. Um, um, and so you can look up all the specific laws and regulations regarding every state. I'm gonna go over how you can find that in a few minutes. So here's the difference between 2019 and 2021. And with uh, 2020, as we know, was kind of a crazy year. But within that time frame, we have gained Oh, almost a million and a half patients. So in 2019, there were about 3 million patients. And beginning of 221, uh, there is now 4.4 million patients across the country, um, which is still a very small portion of the potential of patients that there could be. But really what I wanna show you, and I wanna explain why there's grades here, and I'm gonna go over that in a minute because we do a report every year which grades all the programs. And so, um, as you can see, all the yellow, which are all the CBD states and low THC, all Fs. <laughs> but as you can see, and I'm sorry, the colors are different, but if you kind of look at it, you can see how some of the states have changed. Um, and, you know, so we are progressing, but we're progressing, you know, kind of slowly. Because as if you guys remember, we, uh, California changed this law in 1996. And 25 years later, this map should all be one color, but it's not. So 25 years of advocacy, and we're still dealing with this patchwork of state laws across the country, which is really sad. Um, and so, you know, when you think about advocacy, I think a lot of people tend to just kind of, um, you know, oh, it's going to happen on zone. We're moving there. We're doing it. We're making it happen. But that's not true. We've been doing this for 25 years and some organizations have been doing it longer. And we're still at this multicolored patchy, you know, um, map. Um, so we do have a lot of work to do. Um, okay. So this is our Save the States report. If you've never heard about it, every year ASA, or I think in the last eight years, um, Americans for Safe Access has put together what we call the State of the States report, which grades every single state program in the country and jurisdictions on how they are best providing for patients. So this, I mean, we have a report card for every single state, and I'm going to go over one just as an example. Um, but before I do that, here is, um, this is from 2020. Oops, sorry. <laughs> this is from 2020. Um, so as you can see, um, as I mentioned before, all the yellow, yellow is CBD specific and low THC, blue is adult use, purple is full medical cannabis program, and gray is nothing. So some of these things have changed since then, but this was when we published in September 2020. 
So as you can see, that yellow right there alone, there is like very little access. That is just CBD states and low amounts of THC. We're slowly try trying to change those states, but get huge gaps of access just there alone. Um, and e even the purple, which has full medical program, look at Utah, has a D. So even states that have full medical programs still aren't really um, providing for patients because of the strict regulations, condition lists, um, prices. I mean, you know, I could go on and on. So I just want to give one example of the report card. We have this for every single state. And this is actually, I would go to this report anytime I have a call with anyone from a specific state, I immediately go to the report, get a quick snapshot of, of the state uh, so I can hear their concerns. Because I know usually when I talk to people, it's about some concerns that they have in their state program. So Florida, I just picked a state as an example. Um, uh, we have a improvements and recommendation section. And this is really important. The recommendation section is really important because we send a copy of this report to every single state legislator in the country. Um, and we want them to see these improvements specifically. Although this year, unfortunately, there wasn't a lot of improvements in states because of COVID, um, which I'll go over in a minute. Um, so the second, and I'm sorry, this is really patchy because we have so much information in this report that I kind of had to cut and paste these things. But as you can see, in for every single state, we go over patient rights and civil protections, ease of navigation, access to medicine, consumer safety and provider requirements, functionality, and uh, every year we do a special bonus score. Two years ago, we did it on how states were um, helping the opioid epidemic. And this last year we did COVID, um, how states um, re reacted to the COVID pandemic. So, as I mentioned, um, our bonus score this year was on COVID. Um, and when COVID first began, uh, ASA actually sent letters to every single governor and every single reg regulator in the country uh, urging them to take emergency measures on cannabis businesses to ensure continued access for patients. And that meant from manufacturers, cultivators, dispensaries, the whole process. We wanted everything to remain open to protect uh, patient access to medicine. Because of those efforts, um, 33 states kept dispensaries open. Uh, only 28 states actually officially declared cannabis businesses essential. Um, 11 states allowed delivery or partial delivery. Uh, well, 15 states already had those programs. 16 states allowed telehealth for renewals and 17 allowed every step of the registration process on telehealth. 26 states allowed curbside pickup um, and California allowed it in some jurisdictions. So a lot of good came out of COVID. Not one, declaring cannabis as essential, but also these temporary regulations were, they were always needed. They were needed before COVID. You know, so several states didn't have delivery options. They certainly didn't have curbside pickup. A lot of them didn't have telehealth. These were all things that were needed before the pandemic for patients. And so, you know, thankfully uh, states changed some of their regulations and this is where they really shined because honestly in 2020 states didn't shine anywhere else. So it was really just the COVID. Um, so in our report, this is all in our report, we do have this chart that graded every single um, state on those things I mentioned, delivery, pickup, and that's how they got their score. And there were actually um, five states that got perfect scores, Maine, Massachusetts, Michigan, New York, and Rhode Island all received perfect scores. Um, of the 14 states with low THC and CBD, only, um, only Texas managed to earn points for declaring CBD providers essential and allowing for delivery to patients. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit about the lack of access um, in the states and I'm gonna use uh, Michigan as an example. So Michigan, this, I'm sorry, this was from a report two years ago, this report card. No, actually, I'm sorry, no, this is 2020. <laughs> So Michigan received a B plus uh, this year, which is a really great grade. And also Michigan has an adult use and a medical program. So you would think looking at this kind of report card, you think B plus. 
And I have to say, every time we do these report cards, we always get emails from patients kind of complaining. We used to get patients complaining that their grades weren't high enough, but now we get patients complaining that the grades are too high because they're like, you know, there's so many problems in the state and how could you give it a B plus? And so I hear those concerns. Trust me, I hear them because um, I'm going to explain why those concerns are, are so important. So it looks like Michigan is a great state. However, here's the barriers that still exist, even in a state with adult use and uh, medical. People living in poverty, people who can't afford me a medicine. There's over a million of them. Uh, people serving in probation, living in hospice, residing in assisted living establishments, uh, in patients and treatment centers, federal employees and federal contractors. Um, veterans who rely on the VA for their health, um, elderly or homebound patients. Um, and that was a big issue actually before delivery because there are so many homebound patients that cannot get access um, and uh, delivery has helped out a bit. Uh, employees being drug tested, just this is just in Michigan alone, there's over 2 million patients. Uh, an organ transplant list, that's a big one too. Uh, in certain states, you can be on the organ transplant list and still be a, a legal medical cannabis patient, but in certain, in many states you cannot, which is, is very sad. So right here, just in Michigan alone, there's over 5 million patients that can't have access or that don't have access uh, because it's still federally illegal. So that's why those federal employees um, and people that are, uh, you know, drug tested, it's because of, you know, the federal issues, even if it's legal in the state. So this is what I'm reminded of every day. I know a lot of people are reminded of like, you know, how much access, how much money people are making, how great the industry is. But unfortunately, me as an advocate, I, I get calls every week from patients, usually in one of these categories, um, still trying to fight for their access. Um, and that's why, as I mentioned, we have to keep fighting and we have to keep doing this now more than ever. So right now, what we are doing uh, at ASA is we have a campaign. Uh, it's what can Joe do? Um, and we have five administrative actions that can, he can take, the president can take right now to help patients without Congress. So right now um, you can stop evictions of patients in federal housing, allow VA doctors to recommend cannabis, stop drug testing federal employees for cannabis, reinstate the coal memo, which is really important. And if you don't know what the coal memo is, look it up. It's protection for patients and businesses, uh, basically saying that the Department of Justice can't come in and, and prosecute cannabis related issues in a, in a legal medical and adult use state. Um, and most importantly, establish an office of medical cannabis, a federal office of medical cannabis that kind of oversees all these departments, protects, protects the current, you know, uh, industry and businesses that are providing for patients right now. Um, so right now on our website, if you look over to the left of my screen, it says take action. If you click that button, it'll take you to these five administrative actions where right here on the right of the screen, you will see um, all you have to do is put in your name, your email address, where you live, and it has a draft letter. And you can edit the draft letter. You can share a personal story uh, or an opinion. And then you hit click that take action and it'll be sent to the uh, departments. And so right now we have sent over a thousand, I think it's like maybe over 1500 um, action alerts just on just from this one campaign, which has the five actions and it's ongoing right now. Also, I just want to mention, we do have a membership sale right now for $15. That's going to end at the end of the month. So membership is usually only 35, but right now it's 15. And last but not least, I just want to say we have an upcoming uh, conference coming up at the end of the month. It's going to be focused on our No Patient Left Behind campaign, which talks about this lack of access within states. We have amazing presenters. Um, it's April 29th and 30th, and it's free or it's a pay what you want. So if you want to donate, thank you. We appreciate that. But we know that a lot of people can't afford uh, conferences, and so we also have a free option. So that's it. That is my presentation, and I hope you guys enjoyed it. And we'll see thank if there's any questions. Thank you so much, Debbie. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Really appreciate it. Charles and Tasha, are you there? Do you have any questions for Debbie before we um, 
we'll start wrapping up and moving on to our next presenter. Yes, I do have a question. Um, so as you know, I'm really big into cannabis education. So there's one question here. Um, where do you see the major gaps in cannabis education? And then what do you think should the solution should be to fix that? So the, the, right now, I think there's a lot of gap in a medical professional education. I really, really want to get medical professionals on board because patients actually do want to talk to their doctors. Um, and, you know, patients need education too as well. And we have actually lots of free resources on our website, but I think I think education should come from unbiased resources. I know there's a lot of companies that provide education, which are great or, or kind of push their products. Um, but I think patients um, should try to get unbiased um, education. But also, yeah, I really think that medical professional education, including um, medical schools need to catch up um, and start teaching every single doctor about the endocannabinoid system. And then can, um, since you're on there already um, on the website, can you just show really quick the patient section of your website so that viewers know where to go? Oh yeah, sure. Sorry. It, it's <laughs> such a wealth of information and knowledge. It's okay. Oh, it's yeah. just, I, want, is, I want to highlight because really your website, is. so I'm just going to, you know, say, you know, that I, you know, follow you guys. So the website is new and revamped and yeah. <laughs> has lots of new features and components. And yeah, it, one of the major features is um, the addition or the upgrade of the patient section. So. Right. Yeah. So this is, um, well, we have so many, so many things in our website, but let me just scroll down. This is our homepage. So, um, but patient resources is right here. So there's a lot of resources, also medical professional. Um, and we, um, we have our patient's guide to medical cannabis, our patient's guide to CBD, a travel guide, which is, is amazing because it talks about all the reciprocity in every single state program. So I just, I just love this. So yeah, we have a lot of information. And if you click over here, you get to pick which um, state you want to focus on. As you can see, I was focusing on New Mexico last night. So, um, and like I said, everything from our state of the states report is here as well. So you can look at how your state was graded on everything. And then it also talks about, um, you know, the history and how patients can register and things like that. So we just have like, yeah, everything you need is pretty much on our website. <laughs> it is true. That's why I wanted you to point it out. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I enjoy breezing through the website quite often. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it. Yeah. And everything on our website is free to download. All of our reports, everything is free because we really want, uh, we don't want anything to stop patients from getting access, medical professionals, industry professionals. So everything is free to download and, and share. Thank you so much. And I have one question before we uh, move on is, uh, is how many letters are required to push the industry forward? Oh, <laughs> Letters, oh, for, that is a great question. So we've been doing this for a long time. We, we have action alerts every single month. So if you sign up for our newsletter, every single month we have an action alert. Uh, we have done thousands and thousands. We have done over 100,000 at one point. And, you know, we don't know exactly what changes people's positions when it comes to legislation. Um, we know that hearing from their um, constituents and actually meeting them face to face, which is what we do a lot, does change their minds. So uh, there is no limit to the letters. I think as many as possible um, to get the point across that action, that con your constituents care about this issue and demand a change. So the more the better. Thank you. Charles, do you have any questions before we move on to our next presenter? Yes, Jessica, thank you. I was curious about what your uh, feelings are when uh, when adult use passes, if there still needs to be a medical program and why. Oh my God, yes, yes, for sure. Um, well, number one, pediatric patients. Pediatric patients are gonna get left behind if there's no medical program. Adult use does not include uh, you know, anyone 21 years or younger. Plus, patients have, like I said, a certain, um, issues that that people that use it for adult use don't have patients are looking for relief 
they're not looking for pleasure. And so they, they really need sometimes large doses of heavy THC medicine or, or, or sometimes not. not, that's, you know, I don't wanna assume, but they do have a lot of needs that I think the adult use market like scares legislators. Like when you hear like those THC caps, which are ridiculous, I think they see it from a adult use perspective. But patient need, patients need a lot of THC. A lot of patients need that. And so I think highlighting the patient issues um, are really important because they are different um, than adult use issues. And also parent protections, um, well, things like that. that. Yeah. <laughs> thank you for that answer and thank you for all you do. Thank you.